This video will be on transplant and transplant drugs. So everything you need to know about transplants. And where I work at as a med student, uh, we do more transplants than anything. So you gotta know this call, especially if you're in my, my alma mater med school. But otherwise, you still need to know it for our immune, immunology block, okay? So the first thing I wanna talk about is transplant rejection. That's one of the, the key things you need to know about transplant is the fact that it can get rejected. So rejections. If it occurs within minutes, we call that hyperacute. And sure enough, it'll tell you that in the question stem. They'll reject it within minutes. And what happens is that you have preformed antibodies against the transplant. And it will attack it, attack its blood vessels, and damage the endothelium. And when your endothelium gets damaged, then you can cause a thrombosis. Cause of thrombosis, blood doesn't get through, you get ischemia, you get death of the tissue, death of the transplant, literally within minutes. Thrombosis, necrosis, in minutes. What do you do? I mean, the transplant shot. You have to remove the transplant. Very sad, but you gotta do it. That's hyperacute. Now, you have acute which is not in minutes, that's like super, super acute. Acute is just within weeks to months. And this is not preformed antibodies, this is your uh, B cells making antibodies. So that takes some time. So it's not, it's not within minutes, it's weeks to months. So you make your antibodies, make antibodies, and it will, guess what, attack your vessels. But this is a little bit less severe, a little bit less strong. So you get vasculitis instead. You get inflammation of your vessels, but it's nowhere close to thrombosis and destruction, okay? What do we do? Well, we don't need to remove the whole thing. It's not dead yet. We can treat it with some uh, immunosuppressants, some transplant medications that we'll talk about soon enough. All right, a little teaser for you. So that's Treatment, I'll say, bum, 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 immunosuppressants. Last, you have chronic. And this is the same thing as acute, it just takes a little bit longer. So instead of weeks to months, you might have months to years, okay? Same players, you have your B cells, you might also have some T cells. But you get inflammation of your vessels. You get scarring, you get fibrosis. Um, your smooth muscles might hypertrophy. They kind of brace against all that scarring and the fibrosis. What happens is this narrows your lumen. And so in your lungs, we call that bronchiolitis obliterans. That's not a good term. You basically obliterate your lungs. You get fibrosis, you get pulmonary hypertension. In your heart, if you have narrowing of the vessels, what do we call that? We call it arterial or atherosclerosis. So you have accelerated atherosclerosis. So you can get MIs and stuff like that. Kidneys, you get nephropathy. Nephropathy. Liver destroys your vessels and also destroys your bile ducts. So you can't drain bile, you get hepatomegaly, you get jaundice. Jaundice. <laughs> so destroy bile ducts. Then our last type of rejection, something we call graft versus host. This is a special one because in these three, uh, we talked about how your body is making antibodies against the transplant. You're attacking your own transplant. Here, the transplant is attacking you. The graft is attacking the host. So if I transplant a liver, that liver might have a ton of T cells. And as soon as I transplant that liver, all that T cell goes into my blood, starts attacking my body. Or bone marrow. Something these have in common is that they're very, very full of blood, very vascular, full of lymphocytes. So you transplant that thing, they leak out and attack your body. Attack your body. Attack, you get rash, you can get jaundice, you can destroy your red blood cells, you can get hepatosplenomegaly. You see these signs, you're thinking graft versus host disease. All right? And they're, again, particularly 
particularly common in liver and bone marrow transplants. There are some <clears throat> times where we actually want this and you're like, wait, we want an attack on our own body? What is that? What is that nonsense? Well, how about a bone marrow transplant for a leukemia patient? Leukemia patient, their bone marrow is making cancer cells. We don't want those. So if we give someone with a normal bone marrow, maybe those T cells will destroy those cancer cells. We call that graft versus tumor. Graft versus tumor. So it's not against the host, it's against the tumor cells in the host. So those are, those are some situations where we might need them. And I actually got a question on that before, both on a practice exam and then when I did a clinicals. I was working at Peds Heme Onc. Someone asked when we might, you know, actually like this. Graft versus tumor. And beating around the bush, let's talk about transplant drugs, immunosuppressant drugs. <clears throat> A lot of them work on your T cells, your T helpers, because again, your T helpers kind of mediate a ton of your immune system, adaptive immune system. Let's just draw this out. Here's your antigen presenting cell with this MHC. CD3, CD4, all right, cool. And if there's some co-stimulatory signal, we'll just say this is CD28, B7, all right. There's illustrative purposes, but we activate our T cell. And we said your T cell gets activated, starts secreting all this stuff, starts rubbing up your adaptive immune system, and we kind of left it at that. But let's dive a little bit deeper. Let's dive a little bit deeper, kind of see how it does that in a, in a bio, chemical sense. All right, I know you don't like biochemistry, but I promise it's not that bad. When it activates, links up, activates, does all this stuff, calcium will influx, calcium will influx, bind to something called calmodulin. Calmodulin loads to bind calcium. And when it binds to that, it will activate, activate something called calcineurin. And calcineurin turns N-fat with a phosphate group on it to N-fat without a phosphate group on it. Now N-fat stands for nuclear factor of activated T cells. And all you need to know is that this is a transcription factor. So it works on the genetics of the cell. And when it has a phosphate group on it, it is inactivated. It's inactivated. But if you take that phosphate group on it, then you activate this transcription factor, then you activate the genetics you start revving up your genes. You start revving up your genes, your T cells activated, starts producing proteins like IL-2, and hopefully you know by now, IL-2 is very, very important. IL-2 doesn't activate everything. Doesn't activate your helper T cells, your cytotoxic, your NK cells, everything. So you rev up your genes, you make IL-2, you pump that out. You activate your T cells. Cool, cool, cool. Now some IL-2 will, via an autocrine pathway, come back to your own IL-2 receptors. And that will work on mTOR to activate your genes, and that's like a cycle. And that way, we can activate our, our T cells. Again, just a quick recap. Antigen presenter cell activates your T cells via those two signals. Calcium will influx, bind to calmodulin, and activate calcineurin. That in turn pulls that phosphate group off your transcription factor and your genes will start revving up. Revving up and produce IL-2, which you know IL-2 will activate everything else. And IL-2 will also come back around and kind of help it continue revving up via mTOR. Via mTOR. So that is our system. Now that we know our system, we can find out how we can block our system, stop our T cells, cause immunosuppression so that way we don't attack our own transplants. Right. One of the main players seems to be calcineurin. Calcineurin takes that phosphate group off, activates that transcription factor. So we want to block calcineurin. We call these calcineurin inhibitors. Cool. Fitting name. One of them is cyclosporin. And what it does is it binds a chaperone protein called cyclophilin. 
And when it binds cyclophilin, it will create a complex that interferes with calcineurin, stops it. Stops calcineurin, stops transcription, stops IL-2. Perfect. Another drug is called tacrolimus. It says, hey, I kind of like the mechanism here. I also want to bind to a chaperone protein, but I'm going to bind on a protein called FK binding protein or FKBP. In particular, in particular, I like FK506. So it binds FK506, causes a complex. What do you think that does? Interferes with calcineurin, stops transcription, stops IL-2. Perfect, perfect. These two are very, very similar. These two are very similar. But you can tell them apart by their mechanism. Tell them apart by their mechanism. You can also tell them apart by their side effect profile. Both of them are nephrotoxic, which doesn't really help us distinguish them. But cyclosporin also has gingival hyperplasia, where your gums are growing like mad. They're growing off your teeth. Hirsutism, hair up the wazoo. So someone's given a drug, they're a transplant patient, they start getting a mustache. Your gums are growing out. What did you give them? Or they might take it one step further. What does it do? Binds cyclophilin. If you can look at all these factors and think of how they might ask this, then it makes transplant drugs easy as pie. Easy as pie. Or they might give a drug that says it causes nephrotoxicity, but you don't have gingival hyperplasia. You don't have hirsutism. What did you give them? Cyclophilin. Or what does it do? Binds FK506. Cool. Now, uh, let's talk about another group of drugs. In fact, let's just talk about drugs in general. You have something called serolimus. And you're like, serolimus? That sounds a lot like tacrolimus. Well, what they found out was serolimus also likes to bind FKBPs. And so they just called it something similar. All right? Called it something similar. But the difference is the FKBP that it binds, the FKBP that it binds, interferes with mTOR, stopping transcription, stopping IL-2. If you're wondering what mTOR stands for, mTOR actually stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. Rapamycin. Rapamycin is just another drug name for serolimus. So they actually named it after the drug. They named it after serolimus. So serolimus binds to FK BP, and it blocks mTOR, stopping transcription, stopping IL-2, stopping your T cells. It can actually stop your cells too well and can cause pancytopenia. Last but not least, IL-2 seems pretty darn important, doesn't it? IL-2 makes and activates a whole bunch of T cells. It can come back around and activate your own T cell, rev it up. If we can block IL-2, don't you think that'll help? So we can have IL-2 monoclonal antibodies. IL-2 receptor, sorry, anticlonal monobodies. So you're blocking the receptor, blocking the receptor. These are gonna be your, <sighs> these names are always the worst. Bacil, ba Bacilisumab? You know what, I'm not even gonna try it. I'm gonna put it down on my nose, look at them. Uh, just be able to recognize them on a, on a I guess answer choice. Know them well enough to recognize them on an answer choice. You don't have to know every single letter of these words because they're pretty complex, but enough to be able to recognize them, okay? And then last but not least, I didn't really want to talk about it here, but I guess I, I will. Uh, NFKB is something that activates NFAT, all right? And you can block this with corticosteroids. Corticosteroids suppresses your immune function in about a bazillion different ways. Since we're talking about your T cells, it suppresses it in this way, okay? So just a little something to keep in the back of your mind. Now there's one more thing I wanna to touch on, and it's not really something I need to write or talk about. It's just a little bit, uh, a tip for you. And when you look at first aid, you're gonna see a ton of 
recombinant cytokines and how we use them. You're gonna see a whole list of monoclonal antibodies and how we use them. And you're looking at this list like, how am I ever gonna remember this? This is too much information. Break it up into blocks. So if there's a drug that is used for MS, then take that drug and put it into your neural block and review it then. If there's a drug used in your respiratory block, take it from there, put it in your respiratory block, review it then, separate them. Review them in its context. It makes things way easier. You're breaking it down and you're not trying to cram like 20 different things in one list, all right? That's impossible. So break it up into separate blocks. It makes things very easy. And in fact, if you look at my videos from respiratory, I'll talk about those drugs, all right? So I don't just list them out and talk about them here. Hope you enjoyed the video. That's all you need to know about transplant and transplant drugs. Thanks.